the lovely Mr. Dr. Rick Wallace here. So I watch this gentleman's platform all the time. He gives like some great advice, tools, and structure on just all type of things black, African American, period. So um, Mr. Uh, Wallace, can you please introduce yourself? Tell us a little bit about yourself. Uh, I'm Rick Wallace. Uh, I uh, have a lot going on. Um, and I'll start out with uh, some of the obvious things. People like to know uh, what gives you uh, the platform you have to do and say certain things. Uh, I have traveled along the, the, the spectrum of academics. I have a total of seven degrees, two doctorates, one in theology, one in psychology. I currently run seven businesses uh, that deal with uh, therapy, psychology, fitness. Uh, I sit as the dean uh, for the ministry for the uh i sit as the dean for the school for the ministry of health and wellness at uh, array of hope theological seminary i also sit on the board for crystal institute crystal rain institute which is uh, a part of array of hope theological seminary we are accredited at the university of carolina in chapel hill the university of north carolina in chapel hill um i have written uh and published 24 books to date um, I have written uh, over a thousand academic papers, just complete, completed co-authoring one with a very close friend and colleague of mine, Dr. Michael Blanchard. But probably the things I'm most proud of is the work I do in the black community. Uh, I have for the last 20 years run the Odyssey Project. Uh, I have authored and designed programs like Black Men Lead, which is a rite of passage uh, initiative for young black males. My wife, uh, Marion Wallace uh, runs uh, the organization's Arm to Young Black Girls, which is Restoring Ghetto's Forgotten Daughters. Uh, my wife is a survivor of childhood molestation and rape, uh, a alcoholic and abusive father. Uh, and actually, we kind of came together because of that, and we ended up uh, staying together. Well, and so, um, if you go to the Odyssey Project site, which is www.odysseyproject21.top, you'll see a lot of the work I've done and you can kind of get an idea. Uh, so when I operate, I don't operate from a place of feelings or emotion, I operate from 30 years of research um, and trying to find answers to solutions. So I'm not one for talking about problems without talking about solutions. Mm -hmm. Okay. So that's what I love most about your platform. I see a lot of platforms now. It's kind of like it's creating a war. And I remember you spoke about that in one of your videos. It's just a lot of finger pointing and it's getting us nowhere. I feel like the divide is just growing. So that brings me to my first question that I want to ask you this morning. Um, why does it seem that the divide between black men and black women is growing expeditiously? Now more than ever, there are platforms where black men and black women tear down, demean, and are um, and are in an all-out war with each other. Where did this come from, and how can we fix it? It's a part of a universal identity crisis as it pertains to African Americans specifically, but you can see it um, in different ways in any part of the diaspora, and not even in Africa itself because of colonization. Uh, I think mm -hmm. one person who was able to touch on it years and years ago, uh, whose work is still greatly appreciated is France Fanon, um, Black Skin, White Mask, and The Wretched of the Earth, both outlined the impact of colonization predominantly because he was, you know, speaking from France's domination uh, in, in certain parts of Africa. But you can still see a lot of what he wrote about in the behaviors of the enslaved and ultimately the pseudo freed slaves. And I say pseudo freed mm. because freedom is true liberation to move about and execute your desires and your powers. Blacks have never experienced that in America. And the divide is a combination of the lack of understanding of self, because when you don't understand who you are, you lose sight of who you're supposed to be. And if you don't know who you're supposed to be, you don't know what you're supposed to do. 
So when you don't know what you're supposed to do, people get to tell you what you're supposed to do. That's why you have so many blacks aspiring to the Eurocentric idea of what is the Eurocentric idea of what's classy, the Eurocentric idea of what's beautiful, the Eurocentric idea of what's professional and acceptable and on and on and on. And we will literally fight and push and demand on one another that you need to shave. You need to do this. All the stuff that's a Eurocentric presentation of what's supposed to be. And we, because we don't know who we are, we don't see the beauty in how we naturally are. So there's this natural conflict within self. Each and every one of us has to overcome it because it's a natural environment. We're born up in an environment we didn't create. We exist in an environment that was never designed for us. The only reason we're in the design, we're in inside of the de design is that they had a use for us at a time, at a, at a particular time. And that use wore out and they don't know what to do with us. So they consistently find ways to exploit us without ever truly giving us power. And it would be foolish on our behalf to expect the enemy to give us power. That's why Malcolm, Dr. Amos Wilson and Dr. Khaled Muhammad all said it's foolish to expect your enemy to educate your children to compete with theirs. That's why you will never see the same type of effort put into inner city schools as you see into suburban schools or into more affluent neighborhoods. That's why most school districts are funded by property tax. Why? Property tax dictates how much is going to be paid. More, the, the more affluent the neighborhood, the more property taxes are paid, the better the school, the more supplies, the higher you pay the teacher. So it's a systematic way of creating things. Racism isn't in the thought processes of the average white person. Racism is woven into the entire fabric of the institution, which is now corporate America in every way possible. It's there. You can't help but see it. A person doesn't have to dislike you. What you got to understand is most people see racism. And I'm going to get back to the back end of the question of the division. Oh, I, yeah, I, I know I, how you do. I, I'm, 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 I'm on my way. Back. I know I'm you're back. Way. But most people think racist. They think about the redneck that calls them the N word. Right. Got to be careful if this ends up on YouTube. You don't want to get X for using the N word. So I know. Yeah. So we got to be real careful here. So, but so that's not a racist. That's a bigot, and that bigot is uh, that bigotry is coming from hatred. But guess why they hate you? Because they're in the same condition you're in. But the system told them it was your fault. We go back to redlining. It, when, when a great deal of the hostility between whites and blacks wasn't where it is now, that there was always some animosity in the South. Right. Because of slavery and all the things that transpired. But what happens is in redlining, uh, lending was determined about the presence of blacks in a particular community. So a white, predominantly white community could have just one black family and funding would literally be cut off to that community. You couldn't refinance your home, you couldn't get a business loan. All these things is part of what was known as redlining. It was a lending practice that was uh, embedded in the code of banking that said that we will undervalue properties that are associated with blacks, even communities. So guess what happens? When you start to now be a black person trying to move in a white neighborhood, whites are very, anim uh, very hostile towards you because you're messing with their money. So that became a natural perception of black people that you are harming me. So even the black white people who didn't necessarily have this natural inbred hatred started out of necessity being angry and uh, uh, vitriolic towards blacks. And then it developed into a thing we can't even explain or understand now, but there's always been these little uh, instigative little mechanisms that cause that. Now, you throw in stuff like colorisms, shoot, we'll put division into your own race. We will, we will not allow you to unite. So we introduce colorism. We're gonna reward people for being lighter complected. We're gonna tell them they're more beautiful. We're gonna tell them that they can get better jobs. Why? Number one is naturally without even understanding it, we see them as less threatening. Uh, a guy by the name of- that is, that is very true. I've seen it on my dad's side of the family like, don't don't bring home no dark skin guy and, and mess up our family tree. Like my great my granddad that stays down south really has that ingrained in him. And I was like, are you kidding me? So that's that's true. 
Yeah, That's I'm, correct. I'm, I'm, uh, both sides of my family are from Louisiana and it's notorious in Louisiana. And literally you got family beefing with family based off of tone and hue. So nothing else, same blood. Just a different, you know, different, different complexion. And so, but what happens is that's one way they created division. Then in the 60s, they start to push in uh, white, white female, white feminism into the black culture while simultaneously moving in and pushing in social programs into the homes while simultaneously deindustrializing inner city America. And what I mean by deindustrializing, that it's means black men didn't have to have college degrees to earn enough money to take care of their families back in the 40s, 50s, and the 60s. They were working at Ford, Chevrolet. They were working at uh, Dresser and Clark, Dresser Injury, places that paid them uh, back back then $15, $18 an hour, which was the and equivalent of the that the marriage rate was higher, especially right. here in Chicago. More black people were getting married when those jobs were here. Right, because it was the natural family uh, dynamic. Husband works, wife stays home, takes care of the kid. Right. But what happened is they moved it in. They told the white person, the, the, the white people came in, and actually it was a CIA agent who came in, connected with a black woman uh, who became the black face of feminism at the time, and basically co-authored a book about it but basically convinced black women that white black men were suppressing them. Now, let's not romanticize black marriages then. I, I talked about this not too long ago, is that uh, grandma's secrets, where I talked about there were a lot of things our grandmas hid from us that allowed us to romanticize their marriages to our grandfathers when everything wasn't peachy king all the time. We had grandfathers out creating babies and, and having whole families. We had yes. grandfather. We had grandfathers who were molesting the kids. We had grandfathers who were beating grandma, and grandma kept all those secrets because that was also a natural inclination of the black woman to protect the black man. Because on the on the plantation, the black man was most at threat. Right. So the black woman developed a natural uh, inclination to cover the black man because she didn't want him dead, and we see that now with black mothers and their sons. Where you black mothers are more protective of their sons than they are their daughters. Why? Because they yeah. know he might not come home. Okay, the problem is that's not a natural dynamic. The man is supposed to cover the woman. But what mm -hmm. happens is the man is supposed to cover the woman. The man is not only supposed to cover the woman. See, we we have commodified the black man. The black man during the 60s was reduced to a paycheck. Because everything else the black man did became none, null and void when they said, we're going to give the black woman uh, who wants to do something with her life uh, because the black man has been suppressing her and not allowing her to fulfill her dreams. We're going to let you into our colleges so that you can better yourself. And we're going to let you into our corporate uh, jobs so that you can take care of yourself. For the black women who don't have those aspirations, we're going to give you housing. We're going to give you uh, uh, vouchers for food. We're going to give you Medicaid. You, everything that you would have gotten through the benefits of being married to him, you don't have to have that now. So now the only thing that a woman is looking at when she meets a man is, can you give me everything that they're giving me? And for the woman who's affluent, she's sitting up saying, I don't need a man. Because they commodified him. For the thing, when you commodify a man, all you see is what he brings in value of his paycheck. And if your paycheck is bigger than him, your mind tells you you don't need him. Forget the fact that he's your protection, because no matter how much money you earn, you can't physically defend yourself against a patriarchal society where men are dominant. So you're always vulnerable. And you're the reason they gave you the access while cutting him off and deindustrializing and basically financially uh, castrating him, they gave it to you because you're not a threat. They still maintain a patriarchal society. And the crazy thing about it is the very white females that's been pushing feminism on, on black women will sit up and talk all about women rights until it's time to vote. And the vast majority of them voted for Trump. That's how he got in the first time, was white females. 
what what does that tell you? They'll talk a bunch of stuff, get you all hyped up about it. At the end of the day, they're going to fall in line with what they know takes care of them, and they understand it, and they move in that line. We are more emotional. We are more frustrated. So what happens is because we have this identity crisis and we don't know who we are as men, we need to understand, yes, I need to be a provider, but that's not even my first responsibility as a man. My first responsibility as a man is to be a protector. A black woman and black children and the black elderly should feel safe in the presence of a young, virile and healthy black man. No matter what's going on, a black woman could be in a very, very uncomfortable situation where there are no black people but her. If a black man walks into that space, that level of discomfort should subside. Why? Because I know I'm not alone. And if something pops off up in here, he's got my back. But the black woman doesn't know that. She can't trust the black man right now because the black man has become her number one enemy. Why? Because he bought the lies that she put him where he is right now. So the division comes from us not knowing who we are and having a willingness to look outside of ourselves for the answer instead of inside and them pulling levers. They trigger us every chance they get. And they know now because now they've isolated us so much that black, most black men are looking to defend black women. They're looking to defend themselves. That is true. That okay. Is and, true. And, and there are plenty of black women out there too that are taking every chance they can to take shots at black men. You can't mm -hmm. heal that way. You can't heal that way. The way you have to heal is you have to look inside of yourself and say, am I powerless? And if you think you're powerless, you're already defeated. You might as well just lay it down. But if you decide you're not powerless, then everything that needs to change in your world starts with you. Yeah. So true. it's not it's not that woman. And, and a lot of black men, because we are not allowed to admit we need help, because we are not allowed to admit we have emotional and mental issues we struggle with because we are not allowed. Most of us are taught that a black man don't need no help. So we're all trying to do stuff that we should be connecting and doing as a unit. We're trying to do it by ourselves. So we're overwhelmed, but we're not going to tell anybody we're overwhelmed because then we're going to be called weak. Then we're going to be said, we're so, you know, how many times you see strolling down timelines? You know, if your man can't take care of you 100%, if he can't pay all the bills, if he can't, when in the hell has and that it, ever it, been the norm? It definitely has become like a war because I'll see that. And sometimes I'll be like, oh, I'm just not going to respond to this man putting up this crazy stuff, like of all these demands that they're making of women. And then I'll post like, okay, you want me to do all of that? But what you going to do? And it's just like a war. Like, I get what you're saying. Nobody knows their roles. I actually went to see my therapist to talk about like relationship stuff and how I'm at the point where... I'm just confused now. Like, what am I supposed to be doing? <laughs> so seriously, like, what? we always talking about go to therapy, go to therapy. I said, listen, I'm number one with check. I said, well, let me check and see. And this is like, everything is just thrown off. Seriously. It just, that's why I really want you to come on here and break it down. Because I'm just, at, I'm at the point, like, what is happening? I don't well, know. <laughs> The, the, there are so many different things. And like I wrote uh, in Born in Captivity, Psychopathology as a Legacy of Slavery. I put a lot of energy and effort in explaining this identity crisis. Also in uh, The Undoing of the African-American Mind, which is book number 22. I put, I, I dealt with that. Born in Captivity was book 19. Uh, the Undoing of the African-American Mind is book number uh, 22. And I, I, in both books, I talk about this on, on, on a very in-depth level of how it's manipulating. I also, as a part of the Visionetics Institute, uh, where I work with clients to help them achieve different levels in life, there's a part of my services that deals with couples and counseling and relationships and things of that nature. And uh, it goes to, matter of fact, my fourth book was When Your House Is Not a Home. It deals with conflict mm -hmm. in the marriage. Uh, book number 23 was Merging Souls, Healing Hope and Restoration in Modern Marriage. Uh, both of those books are dealing with uh, all the different things we have coming at us as individuals and how we develop ourselves to be ready for productive relationships. And the truth of the matter is most of us are not because we don't even understand our roles. Roles have been blurred. And one of the most confusing thing, one of the everybody talks about money being the number one cause of divorce. In marriage, but it's actually not. It's expectation. Expect 
un, unachieved or unrealized expe expectations of what causes it, even when it's money. Now, money is the most frustrating unachieved expectation because it has so much impact on everything else. It's hard to do a bunch of stuff without money. So you blame the money, but the truth is I had an expectation that we were going to do this. I had an expectation that we were going to do this. I expected by this time this would happen, but because we don't have any money, we can't do it. Well, the truth is it ain't the money. It's that we didn't get to do this. If you found a way to get all these other things you wanted without money, you wouldn't be worried about the money. Money is a medium. I teach that as well. Money is a medium. It's just one medium. There are a bunch of ways to get to things outside of money if you stop giving so much power to money. That's why we're manipulated and controlled so much is that money has so much power. That's why you can take a kid out of the hood, pay him a $500,000 signing bonus, and he'll change his entire rap content to be everything that you don't need in the hood because you just paid him something that he sees power. I got $500,000 to totally destroy my people. So I'm a, that's not how my rap career started. I was rap, rapping about power, man. I was rapping about... Uh, education. I was rapping about love. I was rapping about all the stuff that my heroes did back in the early 80s and the, the late 80s and the early 90s, but they won't pay me to do that. If I want to do that, I got to go create my own platform and, and, and win people over, but they listening to this stuff and, and, and they paying me just a sign. They pay me this and then I'm going to get this and I'm going to get that and then people will be, a, and I don't even have to be good at it. I don't even have to waste my time really putting any effort into it. I can just mumble it. I can just, uh, I can just put a little something here. And as long as I put some Molly and Percocet over here, slap that hoe over there, do this over here, sh bang that thing over there, <laughs> man, they paying me to do that. I can do that the rest of my life, but I won't get to do it the rest of my life. Why? Because it doesn't require any real skill. And so the next hot thing that comes along is going to bump me out the way and they're going to put them up there until they get old. There's no longevity because there's no demand on quality and there's no demand on content. That's, again, a part of the lack of identity. When you have a true sense of identity, that's why black men lead is so important. It's an initiative to socialize young black males into the responsibility. I had meant to have this up and didn't, but I'm going to see if I can find it real quick. Okay, awesome. Um, because I, I I just want to share, Black Men Leaders is a rite of passage. What I did is I did research. I'm not familiar if you're familiar with the name Dr. Joy DeGry. She wrote Post Traumatic no. Slave Syndrome. Mm -hmm. uh, you definitely want to read that book, Post Traumatic Slave Syndrome by Dr. Joy okay. DeGry. Uh, that's what she's most known for. She's done tours and lectures. Uh, she is uh, a professor at the University of uh, University of uh, Portland. And uh, she has done some great work with that. But she's also done work with Dr. Howard Stevenson out of the University of Pennsylvania on African-American and ad adolescent young African-American uh, and young adult male violence and the things that call that cause that violence. So I piggybacked on their research, conducted my own research and came out with. Uh, I'm trying to get this done. You know something that I really love about what you're saying? So um, it's crazy to me because I've asked, like I posed this question before on Facebook, and I'm like, where are the platforms with healthy black men teaching black men roles? Like even my therapist is a black man, and I feel like it's he's like a healthy black man. It, to me, I hope no other therapists that are female get offended, but um, a healthy black man is really more capable of structuring or setting out the structure of how black relationships are supposed to go because it's not demeaning or even tearing down anybody. And when I've asked men, do why they don't watch those type of, you know, men that I, that have platforms, because I watch them, you're definitely one of them. They, they always say them. like, well, they don't get the views and stuff. And, but you all will follow clowns all that, are, that, that don't even have any solutions to anything. Like, it's a two-way street. Like you have to. It's, I, I feel like you are telling black women what the, how they can be better, and the men. It's a combination. It's just not yeah. you're just picking on right. one person. And even some women with platforms, they're not helping because it's not a solution. It just really it's just going to be it's granting, and it's just getting yeah. us nowhere. And I don't. And they say they don't follow it because well, I don't feel like I need any help on that, or that person don't get any views, and right. they just. It, it, 
They don't. And it's like the help. They don't want the, the help. Is, uh, it's funny because I did the research because I'm a real strong believer that, uh, and I've said this for years. Uh, like I said, I've been doing this for 30 plus years. I came into the black struggle as a teenager. Uh, all my life in school, I knew based off of just how I felt and my natural inclination into research and reading that I was either going to be a psychologist or a lawyer. And actually up until the 11th grade, I was leaning towards an attorney. I was going to be an attorney. I was going to do some work on the legal side of things. And then in 1985, my junior year in high school, I walk in, turn on the television, and there's a show, a talk show on at the time by the uh, name of the Phil Donahue Show. Phil Donahue was a white guy, one of the biggest talk show at the time before Oprah took over, it was Phil Donahue. On Phil Donahue's show was a black woman by the name of Dr. Francis Cress Welsing. Uh, Dr. Welsing was a psychiatrist, uh, and she had written a thesis called uh, uh, the Crest Theory of Color Confrontation. And this was on the heels of just six years before that, the push of black inferiority complex. The notion that blacks are inherently intellectually inferior to whites. They were using uh, IQ scores as the primary thing. And then that was blown up. I've actually written an entire paper on why the IQ uh, uh, quotient isn't a, a good measurement of intelligence, specifically of one particular component. And things are starting to change and people are starting to look at things differently. But anyway, she's on here and she's defending the Crest theory of color confrontation against white scholars. And this black woman is holding her own at a time when blacks are supposed to be intellectually inferior. And at that moment, I said, I'm gonna be a psychologist. So I, now this is 1985, there's no internet. There's no easy access to everything I need to know about this woman. I started to write her. I started to write the universities. I started to go to the library and pull up anything she had written on microfish. You know, this is, you know, you on that big old thing and you're scrolling and it's coming down the screen and you guys say, can I get this printed out? And, and, and I'm doing that and I'm learning. And I said, okay. And then I started to watch some of the uh, stuff that they, that I could find on home video. And she was talking about Neely Fuller Jr who was her mentor. Now, Neely Fuller Jr. is a whole nother level, but something that he's quoted that I always quote is, until you understand and really understand white supremacy, racism, and how it impacts you, everything you think you know will only confuse you. Mm. And he uh, and Dr. Wilson were also the ones who put the notion together that racism exists in all nine uh, areas of human activity. And so it, and it exists in every area. And it, uh, and people say, well, how does it exist in sex? Who you sleep with impacts your thinking, period. That's my biggest argument. The biggest argument against mixed marriages, who you sleep with impacts your thinking. You cannot be completely one with one someone and not assume some of their cultural ideas and thoughts about life. You cannot put that person in the number one spot in your life and take a, a, a unapologetic approach to an idea that doesn't represent them. If I marry a white woman and I'm saying I'm unapologetically black, there's just some things that are not going to benefit her that I have to stand for. She can't be number Something has to be number one. And if my blackness is the first thing that I identify with, I have to have a black woman. I have to. It, it, it's not even a, a thought or option. It's not anywhere around that. Now, the type of black woman is what I'm developing it and in, in, in coming to it as I mature, but it's got to be a black woman. But anyway, I worked my way through all these different people from Dr. Wilson to up until Joy DeGry, and I did research on African-American adolescent and young adult male violence. The understanding that black men, and I've always said this, that we will only get as high as our women can spiritually elevate us, and we will only get as far as our men can physically lead us. We both have roles that are unique to one another, and it requires the sinking of masculine energy and feminine energy to create a synergy, which is a merged force that's more powerful than individual forces. So when you sink masculine energy with physical energy, you actually have the almighty, first and foremost. God is both physical, I mean, most masculine and feminine energy. 
Most people don't realize that because most people refer to God as him, but don't realize that God is the totality of the universe and therefore possesses all qualities. And so the woman is just much as God as the, uh, just much as a part of God as the man. So it's not just one, it's both. It's an understanding of self that you got to have. But what I did is I found out that even when it comes to African-American adolescent and young adult male violence, there are five primary identifying factors that's almost always present. Uh, the first, uh, we're going to start with five up. Number five, urban hassle. Urban hassle is in the, in the inner city, everything that we, uh, if you grew up in the inner city, it was a part of your life. You probably didn't realize it was urban hassle. Uh, gunshots and sirens in the middle of the night, navigating through gang violence to go to school and from school, navigating through drug use to and from school, having to move around. If you lived in the Midwest or in the Northeast, L trains running by your apartment all times of the day, <laughs> rattling and everything. I'll say that train right now. <laughs> okay. All of that's urban hassle and a bunch of other stuff you just deal with being a part of the inner city. That puts a kid on edge, makes them more likely to respond to some type of stimuli with violence. Number four, having witnessed violence. Just mm -hmm. the idea of seeing violence uh, deadens you or decentralizes the idea of okay man that's that that's bad eventually you become desensitized to it so it doesn't mean that big of a deal to you to strike out it might, plus it's a practice habit you see it enough that if somebody does that this is how you respond to it okay the third thing is being a victim of violence if you yourself were a victim of violence as a young male you are more likely to become violent those are the three the top two are the killers number two the lack of proper racial socialization. Young black men who, who don't have any type of rite of passage into manhood that shows them this is what a man does. When you don't, and when you took the black man out of the home, when you put 1.5 of us out of the 1.5 million of us out of the community, a large portion of us are in prison. The others on drugs are just uh, useless. Now there's no model that pro provides this. This 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 code of modeling. So there's no socialization. Uh, I did a study uh, not that long ago, and I ask, as black men, when was the first time you encountered a black male teacher in your academic career? What grade were you in the first time you had a male teacher? My answer was the seventh grade. I was literally 12 years old before I ever saw a man in the class, black man in the classroom. I was in sixth grade. That's true. Okay, that's a problem both for male and females because we don't know how to act with men, interact with men. We don't know how to see men in a professional environment. We don't know how to see men respond to things because they respond differently than women. Okay, okay so we're dealing with all that. So I created Black Men Lead. It's a rite of passage program for children ages four to 13 is the rite of passage, but it goes all the way to age 30 in mentorship. Now, the thing is, you can't get, you can't get support for it we talk we want to talk about how horrible men are but we don't want to talk about what it takes to fix it and that's what i want to know what's the solution how can we can we stop got, this because it's getting bigger the number it's one like, cause of the problem with violence just violence alone not all the other stuff but violence alone the number one cause is the feeling of being disrespected that's true so if you go to prison almost all violent offenders in prison you can tie Black males, you can tie it to some form of feeling disrespected. Doesn't mean that they were actually disrespected. It means they felt disrespected. Even the kids that shot somebody because they was on their block. You knew you weren't supposed to be on my block. You disrespected me. I had to take action. You were talking behind my back. You were messing with my girlfriend. All that is feeling disrespected. All the way down, you kicked my, you kicked my Jordans. Just any, and then when you don't experience power and you haven't seen any black man experience power, you don't feel power. So you try to, you start trying to take it. And the way you take it is anybody that disrespects you has to feel you. Now that's a hard one to manage because you can't dictate how kids, but what Dr. DeGraw did, she created what's called the African-American Adolescent Respect Scale. It's literally giving you all the things you can interview any kid and you can tell how close they are to being a threat to, 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 to committing violence. 
into committing crim cr criminal acts. And you can now intervene. You can intervene. But what happens is number two is the most powerful instrument. If you properly socialize them, you reduce their chance of violence and incarceration by five times. That's why I created Black Men Lead. The problem is you got to convince older men that they need guidance and you got to have access to younger men and then you got to have the resources to carry it out. But the, the, the uh, and I know you have other questions. I don't let you get to them. But oh, it's, go ahead. Yeah. But in essence, what you have to understand in, in all of this is if I don't know who I am, I tend to be all over the place. That's why you got so many people. By the time they get out of college, they've had four uh, uh, four uh, majors. Uh, by the time they're 30, they've had 10 jobs t in different areas in, in totally different uh, industries because they don't know who they are. They're trying to figure themselves out. But it's even more. Uh, devastating when you don't even know how to act as a person. I don't know how to carry myself because I don't know who I am. And so they tell me this is what you're supposed to do. But when I do it like they tell me I'm supposed to do it, I don't feel any fulfillment. I still feel less than. I still feel like I'm trying to be accepted. I still feel like I'm trying to fit in. I don't have a place of my own because one of the yearnings, the internal yearnings of a man is to create something that he created that belongs to him that he owns that he can plant his flag on and hold his chest up. Daniel Patrick Manahan, a white man in the 1960s who was a sociologist, but a, a but a uh, advisor to President Lyndon B. Johnson wrote what is now become affectionately known as the Monahan Report. But the initial report was the Negro, the Negro family, a case for national anthem. Action. There's a part in that, I, I read it, I had to read it like 20 times and I had to sit back and I literally came to tears because I saw myself in it and I saw so many black people in it. And he says, when you go into a black home and you take the power of the black man to make decisions away from his family and you put it in the hands of his wife and a caseworker who now has all the resources that the family needs, even though he's still in the home, He's lost his ability to do anything. We've already taken so much of the power of the black man. He said, watch any other male species on this planet from the lion to the four star general to the bantam rooster. They all strut. They have their head held high. They have their chest stuck out, except for the black man who has his head held, his head hung down. If he would have dad and lift his head and look a white man in the eye, he could end up lynched. He can't beat his chest. He can't back. He can't boast or anything because everything can be taken from him. He has nothing on which to plant his flag and he is always at threat of death. Why? Because the truth is they see him as the greatest threat. If the black man ever gets power, he has the ability to do to you what you did to him and a lot worse. And so we will always keep him broken. And then we can convince his mate that he's the enemy. Nothing, and I mean nothing, can break a black man like a black woman. Just tell him he ain't nothing. Tell him you don't need him. Tell him he can't take care of you like the white man can. Oh, that really gets him. It's so many ways. I mean, and 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 and, and it's so many ways that it's used, and most of the time we don't even realize we've been played. They just throw content out there and watch us go into a frenzy. And you know something about that. So I see that a lot of black men will date white women. But when I've been asked, well, will, have you ever dated a white man or will you? And if I say yes, brothers hate that. But it's okay for them to date a white woman. But I, what you said makes sense. Uh, they I'm don't like it. As we push a fundraiser that you support what the Odyssey Project is doing in the inner cities, uh, especially with programs like Black Men Lead, which is a rite of passage uh, initiative, and Restoring Ghetto for, Ghetto's Forgotten Daughters, which is a program focused on helping young girls, but boys as well, suffering from childhood sexual abuse. Uh, rape, molestation, domestic abuse, uh, absentee fatherhood, and so many other things. Uh, the information will be in the box. Thank you.
they hate it. It just, and I'm just kind of like, it's, it's where? The core of it. What do you have to understand? <laughs> but if you happy with that, if the white woman, why do you care who I date? You get it? I don't, it's just like, but, I'm, but, I'm so confused now. One of the things that, one of the things that I, first, I'm, I'm, I'm going to read, I, I, I pull this up, so I want to read this. Go uh, ahead. But there are 11 principles that we teach young black males. And we teach them in the absence of black women. In the absence of, it's, this is nothing but men teaching boys and then a letting, and every man is married. So they get to observe how we yes, respond and me. act with our wives. Yes. And so it says, uh, a black man never harms, mistreats, or disrespects a black woman, including, including black females of all ages. That's number one. That's the one drilled in more than anything else. A black man takes care of his progeny, his offspring, always has control of his emotions, works so that he can provide for his family, strives to build wealth for his family and offspring, understands the importance of ownership of business and property, is always in a state of learning and growing, takes responsibility for his own actions, seeks wisdom and knowledge from men in greater situations and conditions, abides by a standard of excellence, never settling, never makes excuses for his failures, making the necessary adjustments to overcome them. And this is from what, which program? This is Black Men Lead. Do you have a Black Man Lead here in Chicago, if anybody's interested? I've actually been trying to create a, a program there. Uh, I've talked to a couple of people. And I people. remember I reached out to you about it. I didn't get a lot of uh, I didn't get a lot of men or women that want to participate. Matter of fact, I probably got a few women, but like you said, this is a more of a men thing. And I'm sorry, Dr. White. Hopefully somebody can will see this today, which I'm glad you came on, and people will want to reach out. But I didn't get a lot of black men that want to participate. Right. And the thing is, what gets me in the whole thing is I watch whites gas up blacks to be at odds with one another. And as much as them and that women don't get along as much as you got this massive uh, white feminist movement, white men are taught to marry early. They, they're they are coming home from college with, with fiancés and their divorce rate is high. Why? Because they didn't marry for love the first time. They married for expediency. They needed to create an environment through which they could take advantage fully of the system and the system rewards marriage. This system, this system, period. Look at the tax laws. I mean, everything is about building. We talk about building, but we want to build. I, I'm a building. Now she's over here building and trying to do it on her own. He's over here building. And, and don't realize it works better when you come together. It works better when you have feminine and masculine energy merging. It's a natural spiritual idea and it's a universal uh, financial concept. And everything else in between is built off of that. They are trained to get married. Matter of fact, when you interview for that uh, interview for that position at Howard Johnson and Mitchell, whatever it is, you being married gives you an inner uh, uh, inside route to the, against the person. You could be a white male, two white males, one married, one not. The, the married guy's getting the job. It says I'm stable. It says I'm focused. It says I've settled down. And why people, do you think black men want to get married late? Like it, sometimes you mention their brothers be like married. Like it's like a scam out or something. Because there's an entire culture being pushed via media to sow your raw oats, so to speak. The good I have all that out of your system. And then when you finally get tired, you know you've seen the meme where the guy's in the wheelchair in the hospital gown and he says, I'm finally ready to settle down. Yeah. Well, <laughs> Well, that, that that that's what they're pushing. But you notice that's a meme being pushed on black America. Now, while white people aren't procreating at the rate that they need to sustain their current advantages in the majority, they are still getting married because they're still looking for ways to cover and protect their wealth. And they understand the dynamic at play. What they are doing, when you sit up and you see the media pushing a narrative or a cultural idea that you need to just get out there and do your thing, don't get married too early, you ain't ready for it. What they're saying is by the time you get ready to get married, you've wasted 10 years, 14 years. It's non-productive. It's produced nothing. 
Yeah. It's also made you less trusting because even if you've become successful, now you're leery about the people who are coming into your life because you don't know their motives. Whoops, yeah, right here. <laughs> okay, all right. Prime right example. Prime example. <laughs> and one of the reasons, unlike a lot of people, and I don't get into this debate, LeBron James is not my favorite player of all time. He's probably, <laughs> he's probably my favorite player person at least in the NBA of all time, not because of what he's done on the court, which has been exceptional, but because of how he's carried himself as a man who didn't have a male model in the home. Yeah. Now, yeah, big, back big, to the right. thing. He married his high school sweetheart who was there with him when he was a little poor kid in 14, 15 years old that you knew was promise. And you knew the potential was out the roof, but he hadn't realized it yet. She came in and they built something and made promises to one another that they're still keeping. So he never has to look over to her and say, you came to me just because of my money. You got with me before wow. that was money. Now, you may have knew money was coming, but you was there when there was still no promise. I could have broke my leg. You've been there. You rear my children. You provide counseling to me. And when I have those rough days and I come home, you do this for me. Whatever's going on, there is this relationship that you don't get to get when you've been 20 years in the game already. You've built everything. You've bought your own house. You've got your own car. And here she comes. Yeah. Plus, you've developed, you developed a mentality and a mindset of just bedding women and moving on. 20 years of not having to settle down, how do you just settle down at 40? Yeah. If I'm yeah, a woman, I'm I want to know. If I'm a woman, I want to know. Shoot, you 40 and years like, old. I hear all like with the argument and stuff that's going on. I actually I put this on Facebook. I asked how many men are intentionally dating um, you know, for marriage. I said, drop a purple heart. I got like two purple hearts for the entire day. <laughs> and my friend reposted it and she didn't get any. And I'm like, but we're making these demands on what the roles that um you want women to play, but no but you all nobody wants to get married. So who's Who's playing the roles? I'm playing this okay. as a girlfriend, but you don't want to get married. It's, so, it needs to make sense. So in, 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 in both When Your House Is Not a Home, my fourth book, and my 23rd book, Merging Souls, Merging Souls uh, one of them, man, I got books everywhere. But <laughs> well, at least they're your books. That's good. Well, yeah, this is book number 23. Well, I got everybody's. I read. I read. I read uh, on average 100 books a year. Okay, I'm a reader too. I don't even have a TV, so I'm that's all I yeah. do is read. <laughs> right. So I'm constantly reading. Uh, my grandfather always told me, it, "You like to talk, so for every word you speak, you need to read a hundred. So even when I write, for every word I write, I have had to have read at least a hundred. And so that's how I, I'm, I'm studying, educating myself. That's how I grow. That's how I ensure I grow every day. I read something new. Okay. My goal is never go to bed the same person I woke up. And the way I do that is I learn. I learn something new every day. But in, in, in Merging Souls and in When Your House Is Not a Home, um, I talk, there's a section on the myth of dating. And I talk about how dating has, to westernized dating has totally destroyed the capacity to live true, full marriages. And I, I explain why. I didn't date my wife. I didn't date my wife. What happened? I failed that marriage twice. And the second time I felt was over 20 some years ago. And I told myself, I'm not doing this again. I knew I wanted to be married because I grew up in a house with both parents. I was reared by my great grandparents. I was reared by my grandmother's parents. They were married uh, for 43 years when my grandfather died. And so I grew up in a house with marriage. I grew up in a house with two people functioning in very unique and consistent roles. And I knew that I wanted to be a husband. So I got married early. First one was off the chain. Not gonna get into it. I don't badmouth any of my exes. But it was, it was, yeah. The second one wasn't as bad, but it wasn't what I wanted. So I knew after that ended, I needed to know what I wanted. And I realized the first problem I had and why I was feeling, I didn't even know what I wanted in a woman. I'm just being physically drawn to women and going, hey, you pretty cool. We cool. We kicking it. We having fun. Let's get married. Because I wanted to be married. I wanted to be married so bad that, hey, we don't got along for a while. Let's get married. <laughs> and so that didn't work. So I needed a new approach. So I said, what do you want in a woman? Now, this is the crazy part. 
when I sit down and I actually thought about the qualities I wanted in a woman, like you said, these guys going around putting out what they want. Guess what the first thing, after I found that woman and I put all those qualities out, guess what the next thing I realized? I didn't have what it took to have a woman like that. I wasn't there yet. Oh, a word, yeah. So now the next 12 years is me becoming the man that can have that woman. So now I'm not I'm not dating. I'm not doing anything. And I made up in my mind. I can't date. Here's why you can't date. When you date, you got to understand the dynamic of human connection. You also got to understand your connection styles. That's something called a connection style. How you connect to people is going to be based on how you grew up. Some of it is out of need. Some of it is out of desire. Some of it is a bunch of different ways you connect. You got to know how you connect so you can manage how you're dealing with people or you end up in relationships and connections you don't belong in. Most people don't realize that. So you got to understand your connection styles. But when I started looking at it, I said, wait a minute. This this whole dating narrative, because what I did is I to write when your house is not a home. I did research. I interviewed people who were divorced after a year. I interviewed people who have been married 50 years. And a, a couple of things totally blew my mind. One of the phenomena that jumped out is the shorter the dating period and the engagement period, the longer the marriage lasted. Of course, there's exceptions to the rule. But for the most part, from the point, there was one couple that literally met each other. There was this unbelievable desire look like, I know I want to be with you. He was shipping off to go to World War II. And they got married three weeks into knowing each other. He went, did his thing, came back, and they were still married at the time I did the interview. Almost 50 years later. Okay. Then there were people who had been dated for 30 days, not been been with each other 30 days, 90 days. And there's two types of dating. There's dating with the purpose of what old people call courting, meaning that I'm telling you I'm interested in you. I'm going to invest all my time into getting knowing you to validate that what I see in you is really true. And if what I see in you is true, I'm going to marry you. So I'm not here to waste your time. If you are really what I see from where I'm sitting now, as I get to know you in a very short period of time, we'll be married. That's courting. To me, that's not modern dating. Modern dating is saying, we're going to go out. We're going to enjoy each other, but we have no obligations, no strings. You do what you want to do. When you, when I'm not around, I'm going to do what I do. I might be dating multiple people. Here's where the problem comes in with that. Number one is, if I date you, I go out on the first date. On the first date, it's a filler. Might come to find out I can't stand you, that you got some things you do when you eat that drive me nuts. Can't be around. So, But what you find out is if you get to the second date, you can have a bad first date, but that's still this draw. They say, man, we're going to give it one more try. Maybe it was just a bad date. So if you get out on the second date, you saying, okay, that's something about this person. I'm going to give one. If you end up on the third date, there's something in that person that has the ability to draw you. So now you sit up and you make the proclamation that we make. Hey, we're just dating, no strings attached, no expectations. But every time you spend time with them person, you become more emotionally attached. It's that's impossible true. not to. You can say what you want to say, but that's the way we're built to create human relationships. And you do kind of know about a second date as well, uh, right. Dr. Connors. You do. Right. That's true. Right. So, so now, every time I spend with you, no strings attached, but I'm becoming closer to you. Let's take sex out of the picture. We decide no sex, but every, every time I spend time with you, I get closer to you. Six months into the game, you decide, you know what? I'm tired. I'm not feeling it. It's been good. I'm going to go. Guess what? You take a piece of me with you. There's no way I could have spent six months with you without you having some of me. And you take it with you. We didn't even sleep together. That's that's soul ties. That's on a whole nother level. It, that's in that book, too. The soul ties. We slept together. It's even worse. Even though we sit up saying you blaze me, I blaze you. It's all good. Soul ties. You're taking a piece of me with you. Now I've got to recover from that. But guess how I recover from it? I go to somebody else and do it all over again. So I'm leaving pieces of me behind dating mm -hmm. now here's the second part of why it doesn't work i'm dating multiple people guess what i'm 10 when i date when you date multiple people you tend to find people in different cave, different caveats of how you live your life so say for instance you love movies you got your movie chick 
I, 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 that's Bay. You go to the movies with y'all. Love movies. Y'all can sit up and y'all into it. You love her because she really gets it. You don't have to explain the movie to her. She she gets it. Y'all both there enjoying the movie. You don't have to spend half the movie explaining what just happened. That's that was always something with me. I can't stand having to explain the movie while I'm trying to watch it. So I need. So I'm I'm there. I'm doing that. So that's that's movie. You like a person you can dine with in fine dining. Not everybody's meant to be taken to fine dining. You can't just take everybody to find. You need that person that knows table etiquette. The person that knows to let you pull out their chair. The table, the person that knows to let you call for the waiter or the waitress. All the little things in fine. You got to find out. Then you got the uh we kick it, boo. You know, they go to the game with you. They the down person. They know about sports. They talk almost like a dude, but they feminine. So that's your kick it person. Then you got the bedroom boo. That's she put it down. She <laughs> have you thinking, man. She'll have you talking crazy too, man. When I get myself down, I'm sitting down with her. But, but, <laughs> but, but, but you know all that. So you got all that. So you got everything you ever need covered in five people. Right. Guess what happens when you say I'm ready to settle down? It's no damn body in the entire world that does all of that. But you've trained yourself to have it all. So now you settle down with one person, you feel cheated. I used to have it all. <laughs> now I got to give it up. She don't know jack about this movie. Or you know, can't take her to find out. You can't take her. She's just going to sit up there. She might pull her shoes off in the dining room. I mean, you know, it, that, you see, that's what relationships do. It makes you have to grow into the person because they're not going to be everything you think they are. You aren't everything they think they think you, you, they think you should be. That's the part that's of life true. about growing. You grow into each other. You help each other. But see, the problem is when you got all those people out there that cover every base for you, when you got to give them up for one person and that person may cover three bases and two of them kind of uh, now you feel like, man, I, I did better out there dating. But the problem is you can't build with five people unless you want to go into polygamy. That's a whole nother story. Lord, that's going to be a whole nother day. <laughs> yeah, that's a, whole nother, that's a whole nother topic. What I'm trying to get you to understand is there are a lot of different ideas. Now, when I met my wife, like I said, I never dated my wife. My wife came to me, like I said, she was a survivor of some very traumatic childhood experiences, and she had decided that she was going to do the work to heal. So she was healing herself. She had took a lot of that into her adult life, and she had decided she was going to heal. So she came to me, and uh, I worked with her as a client. And I encouraged her. She was talking about God was telling her to write a book. I said, you need to write the book. I encouraged her to write the book. We worked together. We broke off. She went off, wrote the book for a year. I'm doing off doing my thing. She pops back up on my radar. And we communicate. Uh, within two weeks of communicating with her on the phone, I told her I wanted to marry her. I knew from working with her who she was. I knew her heart. I wasn't looking for somebody perfect. I was looking for the right heart. A heart that could let me lead, a heart that would let me cover her, but a heart that was strong enough that when things got tough, she wasn't going to fold on me. I, I, I saw all of that and I said, I got the rest of it. So I told her, I want to marry. I want to look for somebody perfect. Here, yeah, we created a hell of a blended family. She brought six, I brought seven. We got 13 kids. Oldest, 35, mine. Youngest, seven, mine. I just don't know how to stop. I had, you know, but my thing is, we came together, we created this family, and we operate. There's no stepkids in the family. Those are my kids. Those are her kids. That's how we operate. But I know my role, and that's what she trusts me on. And the one thing that she, she'll tell anybody, one thing she tells me is what makes me feel so loved isn't the romantic stuff. I'm not very romantic, but the romantic stuff that you do when you do it, it's not the affection you give me physically. It's that. There's never a time I look at you and think, man, we're in trouble. Things can be crazy. And I'm just like I am now. I never raised my voice with her or the kids. I talk to her just like I'm talking to you right now. Hey, we're not doing that. And I don't argue. We're having a disagreement and you, you, I tell you what, we'll talk about it later. And that's the end of it. At first, boy, that used to drive her nuts. No, 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 we're not going to tell you. I've done. I'm now, not gonna a lot of people don't know how to handle like a woman being emotional. 
in, in a healthy way. So I can tell you definitely, you definitely have to see it, see it be done in a home for you to know. My how grandfather to never raised his voice in the house ever. Right, I can see. Uh, and, yeah. and so I learned how to be calm without even being told I had to. Yeah. Is that this is what a man does. Anybody, let me tell you something. People who have power don't raise their voice. Mm. People who have power don't raise it. Why? Because they know they got it. People don't get upset and frenetic until they get into places they're not sure. That's when you start to start acting out is when you're not sure. The most acting out kid in the world is a three-year-old. The terrible, the, you, you, you done been through the terrible tools, now you're at the tantrum three. That's where everything that happened that you don't get your way, you finna fall out, kick, and scream. Why? Because you have no power. You can't make nothing happen. So you just gonna lay out on the floor and kick and scream. And that's why all of my kids find out real quick, we don't throw tantrums because tantrums don't get you jack in this world. And so you're going to get up and figure out what you need to do to get what you want. And then if you can't have it, you're going to learn how to deal with it because you don't get everything you want. And so my kids learn that early. You throw tantrum out. Like my three-year-old grandson right now, my wife can't stand it. She talked about you. Y'all make me sick because we're like this, me and my, th my grandson. She's the one that's crazy about it. Oh, my God, my baby. Whenever he goes home, like he comes over for the weekend. When he goes home, oh, man, don't you miss him? I'm like, he just left 30 minutes ago. Oh my God. My, <laughs> but like, as soon as he gets there, he runs in, Paw Paw. He runs and jumped to me. Uh, it's kind of funny because I'm in this office now because for years I had my office at home. But he would wake up and I would be literally on something like this. And you look up, he would be the climbed in my lap because that's just how, how tight we were. Uh, one day I came home and, and, and he was in my home office and he was sitting at, at my desk and he was typing on the, on the keyboard. And I'm like, what are you doing? He said, I'm working. He saw a man doing something and it's already in my thing. Well, you got to work. So he's like, hey, I'm working. So he'll have her call me like when I come. So but what happened was he was interview interrupting uh, interviews and streams and stuff so much. She said, Rick, uh, I know that your people love to see him and they love how patient you are with him and how everything. But it's not necessarily professional. You're going to have to go back out, back into the world, get your office. So I went and got the office. That's where I'm at now. But I said all that to say, uh, I while while uh, she's crazy about it, I'm the one with the personal relationship that she just, oh, my God, he just comes in. He's all over you. It's because I'm showing him something that he relates to. He knows I'm a man. He knows she's a woman. When he wants his breakfast, he goes to her. But what, how many of our men aren't getting that? And how many of our men are being literally taught by women and reared by women? One of the things I tell mothers when they bring black boys to me, and I have a, a number of those, they bring, bring black boys to me and they're saying, this is going on. I said, first and foremost, if they're young kids, five, six years old, I said, at, at the age of six, no longer physically correct him. Do not physically correct him after six years old. You do not want to train a black male to be dominated by a black woman. He'll never be a man. What should they do? Find a man that they trust. And that's where it comes in. We don't want to trust, we want to do it. But what happens is when you take a female and she's the dominant force in his life the whole time, he wakes up and he's going to go out and find a woman who dominates. But then when she expects him to step up and be the man, he can't because he's never taken the lead. And my mother had to do that. She actually, when my brother got like around, uh, maybe like eight or nine, she um, found a program for him um, at Glenwood School for Girls and Boys. And he would go out there, it was like a Marine Base School, and he would come home every weekend, all the summer break. But yeah, it was it was for at-risk youth. And there was like house parents, of, uh, right. you know, a married couple. So that's true. And my brother, he he is a man. I give him... Yeah, that's you, you, a sacrifice hey, she said she was. I tell people man. all the time. I tell people all the time. Uh, without without being too graphic, a woman cannot teach a boy to be a man. A, a woman can provide an environment. She can have the best job in the world. She can provide him with all the material things, but she cannot teach him why. Because the majority of manhood is not taught by word. It's taught by modeling. It's taught by watching. Even when it comes down to how he pees, you can't teach him to pee standing up. He got my grand my grandson just started that about four weeks ago. My wife was screaming, Oh my god, he walked up to the toilet, he just started up here. Why? Because he watches me and his dad do it. I purposely he and, and I told his dad, when you go use it, 
When you go use it, you need to let him walk in there and watch you so he can see that you do it differently than his mom or his aunts or whatever. He needs to see that. And so now he walks up and, you know, just like the average man, when he's got a uh, TT, he don't sit down. And you can't make him sit down if he just got a TT. I, he'll tell you, I got it. And, and But what he's doing is he's he's had he has man the, 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 the most basics of manhood being modeled. And so, and so that's a part that's missing. When you have 1.5 million black men missing, where for every 100 black women, you only have uh, 83 black men. That's conservative. I, it, it, it probably was a little worse than that. But I think we also need to watch the narrative that is being presented uh, by mainstream media that creates another fuel that you talked about earlier that black men gravitate towards black white women. The truth of the matter is 88% of black men who are married are married to black women. Uh, but those narratives won't get pushed because they have no benefit to the culture. They have no benefit to mainstream. It's better for mainstream to put out the black man who gravitates towards the white woman. Why? Number one is it angers the black woman. And normally they say stupid stuff. Like when they do gravitate, they get because they know they don't need to be over there. They got to justify why they over there. So now it's the black woman's fault. You chose a white woman. You know, I, I, I were the white woman because they're less confrontational. The truth of the matter is, I've done research. You know who's most likely to kill their mate out of anybody? Let a me white say. woman. Oh wow! <laughs> a white woman. Uh, and it kind of started just out of a thing is I study criminal behavior because I want to understand the criminal mind because I want to be able to remove it from my people. But I study it in our groups. You just can't study your group because you need to know what, how your group differs from other groups and how your groups is the same. Like they talk about black on black crime. I won't let someone use that around me. Why? Not until we talk about white on white crime. Why? Because 84 percent of white people who are murdered are murdered by white people. You never hear white on white crime. Why not? There's no narrative for it. There's no need for it. It's used to sit up and paint black people in a certain light. Well, I need to study. Well, in studying, I, there's a show I've been watching for years called Snapped. Yeah, Snapped yeah, is about I'm couples where one couple, one of the people in the in the relationship loses it and kills the other person for a number of different reasons. The most yeah. common killer on Snapped is a white woman. That's true. <laughs> I, I mean, and so that led me into my, my research. I'm like, hey, I'm not talking about the type of killing that happens when there's an argument or a fight and stuff breaks out because that's a I'm talking about you will never see it coming. The person that got killed didn't know they were going to bed and going to die that night because they've been plotting and scheming. They've been looking at you. My 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 fourteen year old son, my youngest son, the, the seven year old's a girl, uh, but the youngest son is fourteen. Me and him spent the day together yesterday, uh, and we're all gonna spend the weekend together. But uh, the fourteen year old will not eat mashed potatoes ever. You know why? He made the mistake of watching Snap me one day, and the woman said, "I'm gonna put some arsenic in his mashed potatoes." So now he won't eat mashed potatoes. He's real, real. <laughs> Vigilant. He's like that. He's like borderline. Uh, uh, you know, he he he's always something's gonna get no boy. Everybody gonna pardon your freaking mashed potatoes. He won't eat mashed Why? potatoes. But you know, the thing is that idea that white women are more docile. Do your research, and you'll find that the most feared person on the plantation wasn't the master, it wasn't the overseer, it was the mistress. That white woman who was married to the master was the most feared person on the plantation. She couldn't stand the black female slaves because she knew her husband was out there diddling and daddling. And she couldn't control. So the way she expressed herself is she, she would have different people killed or she would have them whipped for the slightest little freaking thing. That, her insecurities were played out in the lives of the slaves. It's funny that you say that because I remember uh, Nick Cannon, you know, he had a video and he was like the, the white woman who kind of was his prize because, you know, she used to be clean and, you know, you know, the black man just couldn't have her. And so that's why, you know, he, you remember, do you remember that video when he came out with that? 
Do you remember uh, any of that? I, I don't remember that one. I don't remember that one. I've seen a few yeah. of them, but I don't remember he that one. But... She was always something he wasn't allowed to have. And so that's why, you know, uh, black men kind of va value them a little bit higher than uh, black women. But what I tell so black for men. for you to say that is like, wow. But th what I tell black men all the time is, I say, you have to be really, really careful and be aware. That's why self-awareness and self-love is so important. I said, let me explain a dynamic to you. Whether you want to admit it or not, you're black. And deep down inside, you you are you you associate yourself with being black. Now you may be out getting a white woman like uh Gilbert uh Gilbert uh Arenas, the basketball player, uh got with his white woman because he wanted like to play the kids and they still came out dark. I laugh today about that stuff. But all the different reasons why these black men are getting with white women. Uh, like like Nick said, some of them think it's a prize. I've moved up. Now, some of that goes way back to the day when you couldn't have her, when there were anti miscegenate uh, laws right. that said you they couldn't mix that. races. Right. You couldn't have her. And you could literally be lynched for looking at one. Right. Okay. The, uh, a, a lot of the stuff that we talk about, like Tulsa, white woman, Rosewood, white woman, was the catalyst behind those riots that broke out and destroyed black communities that were thriving. Now they were looking for a reason to do it, but it was a white a white woman weaponizing her whiteness that caused it. There's nothing like a white woman weaponizing her. Oh, they love to play the victim if they didn't start some bull crap or create a situation that didn't exist. Emmett Till dead because a white woman weaponized her whiteness. And then later in life before she died said that it wasn't true. Now, so we got that, but but what happens is what black men don't understand when they go out to this prize that what they're doing is actually taking a shot at the white man. Okay. They're taking a shot at the white man. I got your most valuable prize possession. Look what I got. Here's the problem. In most instances, you didn't get their prize. You got the stuff that they left behind and didn't want. You didn't get the baddest white chick out there. You went and got that stuff that nobody else over there wanted, and they're happy you took her. When they come over and they get our women, they get the best of the best. They come over, and when they raid us, they get our the women we're looking at and going, man, that's that, that's the ones they come get. They come get our Janet Jacksons. They come get our Serena Williamses. They come get our Eves. They come get the chicks that we're looking at and going, man, that's the baddest chick out there. And they come get them. We go get Becky. Becky, trailer park Becky. That 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 ain't got nothing to offer. They merging wealth and wealth. We going out there getting somebody else that's gonna cost us we can't afford. And and that's the joking side of it. Here's the here's the real true social side of it. As a black man, I cannot look at a white woman and see her as being inherently and just naturally better than a black woman solely because she's white without inherently and subconsciously believing the white man is better than me. If whiteness makes her better, just, just, just being white makes her better than the best black woman then the white man is better than me. I can't use, I can't, I can't compartmentalize that. If I think whiteness is better, then I think the white man is better than me. Now I'm already at a disadvantage in life, period. I have to see the black woman as the pinnacle in order to see myself as the best. I can't look at her and not see me. Because when I see her, I see the womb from which I came. Not a perfect womb, not a woman. See, that's the whole idea. We want to see the failures and the faults in everyone without seeing the beauty and the power because the beauty and the power is where the healing is. Yes, we got some problems. There are some problems with black men out there. There's some problems with black women out there. There's some shady, crazy stuff going on on both sides if you want to be honest about it. It is. It but is. if I'm going if I'm to bring about healing, I got to look in deep and find the things worth saving. And that's what you fight for. That's what you live for. I say it all the time. And my wife quotes it now when she's teaching women. I said, when I find the woman I want, I'm pretty sure she's going to have been beat up by life because that's the story of most black women. I said, but you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to love her back to life. Look, and that, that's been the goal of me being with my wife. Now, and my thing is my wife brings something to the table. 
I never had to tell my wife what to bring to the table. You know the list that we making. You got to do that. Yeah. I never told my wife what to bring to the table. I brought something to the table that demanded it. I brought yeah. something to the table that anybody that didn't have what I needed was too intimidated by it to even sit down at the table. Mm. And women need to do the same thing. You need to know yourself so well and carry yourself in such a way that the man that sits down at the table can handle it. Stop trying to find somebody or convince somebody to take you how you are. Build yourself into being. A lot of you do need to stop worrying about being with a dude and start working on you first. Yes. That's yeah. what needs to happen. It's a bunch of us. And see, uh, that whole thing with Kevin Samuels. And, you know, I've had my back yeah. and forth with, with his followers and, and they don't like me. But the whole thing with Kevin Samuels, the reason he has followers is because you got a bunch of women out there that don't know who they are. They don't know what they need to do. You got a bunch of women out there with unrealistic expectations. And so all he's doing is feeding off of that in a sensationalized way that builds a following that pays him. This isn't about yeah. healing. This is a money, that's a business move. He's eating off of dysfunction. My thing is this. Yes, if you've got to call into a black man who really isn't carrying himself like a man to ask him what to do to get a man, you need to sit down and work on you. Hello. End the story. <laughs> Stop asking. Because number one is, I don't care how you look. If you start caring about yourself, you'll change your looks. Not because you're worried about what somebody's seeing, but your natural desire to take care of yourself will have you eating better. It will have you exercising. It will have you working out. And you will start to see the change physically and all of a sudden get addicted to the change. But you've got to care enough about yourself. Nobody else can tell you to do that because even if the people who are listening to him and a bunch of other these uh, gurus, male and female, who are listening to him, if you go out and change for the wrong reason, you've got the wrong motive, you end up with the wrong results. You, your motive has to be pure. Why are you doing If you're doing it to get a man, that's not going to work because when you get him, you're going to find out he come with a lot of work too. You better work on you for you. You better work on you because that's what you need to do. And just like I stood up and I told Derek Jackson two or three years ago when he was doing that, stop letting them do this. Stop letting them do that. Stop. We ain't going to even get into what he was doing at the time. I'm just talking about while he was reaching out to women and how he was pandering to the black woman that wanted to blame the black man for everything. Stop that. You don't need to let him. Do I sit up and I just sit up and, and, and I sent a word out to him. I don't know if he got it or if he even gave a damn because, again, he's eating off of dysfunction. I sit up and said, let me tell you something. This is what I know as a professional. When you sit up and show a woman who she really is, you don't have to tell her what she should accept and what she shouldn't accept. When a woman knows who she is, the very nature of her identity and the understanding of who she is will tell her what she will tolerate and what she won't. You don't have to tell her not to. Show her who she is and it will automatically take hold. Someone who knows who they are will not accept X, Y, Z, will not let somebody treat them X, Y, Z. You ain't got to tell them. Stop. You can tell them that all day long until they see who they are. They're going to still let somebody do it. Because they're looking to somebody to validate them. They're looking for somebody to provide some type of affirmation or confirmation of who they are. Stop doing that. Start knowing who you are and you will start creating the type of person that will literally raise your vibrational energy, your frequency of operation on a regular basis to where a lot of that crap will miss you anyway. Most of you aren't functioning on a frequency high enough. True. So... I mean, I, I may have gotten way off base. No, but, no listen, I love but, it. This is but, great. You know, those are just some of the things. It's and, and it's only because just imagine consuming a minimum of a hundred books a year and consistently doing research on every area of black existence, from economics to marriage to education to incarceration to benign neglect and all of the other things over and over again and you read all this and then somebody puts you down and says, tell me about this. <laughs> and then all of this stuff just starts coming out. It's so much wrong that you, you, you ask an open-ended question, you either get an hour and a half of me just going off because no, I, and, it, it's great. and it's interconnected. 
you, you can compartmentalize it when you want to talk about it and categorize it, but it's all interconnected. This affects this. This affects our socioeconomic status affects our education. Our education affects our incarceration. Our incarceration affects our ability to parent because one parent is now missing. All of these things are interconnected and the system is set up to exploit it. And then we are in a situation now where we've been conditioned to blame one another. And so now the situation gets worse and worse because why? Nobody's trying to fix it. Everybody's too busy deflecting blame off of themselves onto the next person. I can never, ever truly work on me if I'm studying talking about the person who did something to me. The person who hurt me, the person who put this scar right here, put that scar there. But if all I ever focus on is that person who put that scar on there, guess what I'm not focusing on? Healing the scar. Yeah. And here's the other thing. We got to stop confusing fault with responsibility. A lot of people confuse fault with responsibility. What do I mean by that? Because it's that person's fault. That person needs to fix it. Oh, no. You'll spend your whole life messed up. Because a bunch of times, a person who broke you, a person who hurt you, a person who disappointed you, the daddy who left you, the daddy who abused you, the mama who mistreated you, the mama who skipped out on the family, ain't ever coming back. The, the mama who had a drug addiction, the mama, who, the daddy who was alcoholic, ain't never going to apologize, ain't never going to fix it, ain't never going to contribute to it, won't sit in one session or treatment or counseling session with you. You better fix it. You're going to have to be the one to sit up and say, I can't be like this anymore. I'm going to heal it. I'm going to take responsibility for fixing my life because nobody else has that responsibility. Not even the person who broke it. Yeah. When you start deciding that I'm responsible for fixing what's wrong in my life, you'll be surprised how little time you have to blame somebody else and how much actually gets done. That's the problem we have. We've been trained to point the finger. I'm and when you a, say we, do you mean the black culture or just society as a whole? The black culture especially because we had no power. You don't have to point the finger when you can change something. White people have been taught you can change something. White people have been taught you got the resources at your finger to change something. We built the system for you. White people have been told if you ain't doing well, it's because you just don't want to because we just set it up for you. No. And just the mindset of that changes how you view life. Now, that's a bunch of white people who are really, truly poor. More poor white people than black people because there's just so many more of them than it is of us. But at, as a general rule, if they're exposed to anything, they're exposed to a whole world that paints them in a light where they see a, 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 a light at the end of the tunnel. They see uh, a rainbow. We are in, a, in, in an enclave in which if we don't hammer hard, we won't see light at all. It's a bunch of us that believe suffering is our lot in life. Poverty is our lot in life. Dysfunction is our lot in life. We experience so much dysfunction and toxicity. We claim it as a part of our culture now. That's just how we are. No, that ain't how we are. That's how broken people who are black are. If you heal the brokenness, we won't be like that. If you heal the generational trauma, we won't be like that. That isn't culture. That's transmit. That's multi-generational trauma transmitted over time, both through learning theory, through exper experiential observation, and through epigenetics. We're literally passing down trauma in our genes. And, and nobody wants to confront it. Nobody wants to deal with it. Nobody wants to invest in themselves. Nobody wants to take the time to heal. But everybody's got a problem with everybody else. If everybody started working on self, man, we would be unstoppable. Mm. So, Mr. Wallace, if people want to get in touch with you, um, like, because I know you still want to set that program up here, the Black Men Lead, how can they, I'm pretty sure after they watch this, some gentlemen are going to want to be a part of that. How can they get in touch with you, your channel? Can you please give out that information? Okay. Uh, on YouTube, it's the Black Voice. Uh, go on YouTube and just type in the black voice of Dr. Rick Wallace. Um, if you want to talk to me about being a part of, of set, setting up a chapter of black man leading your city, uh, you can email me at CEO at the Odyssey Project 21.top. If you want to support the black man lead, go to the Odyssey Project. Dot, I mean, the Odyssey Project 21.top backslash black man lead, black. Uh, hyphen men hyphen lead or just 
put in the search box. And Black I'm actually going to put that. I'll just put it in my um, attach it to this video. Okay. So I'll Those have are, that sitting open for me. Yeah. Right. You can go there and you can support the work we're doing because we definitely need the resources. Uh, but just reach out to me and I will be happy to help anybody who wants to set up this program in your city, because my goal is to have a national network where we're all connected, where we're all sharing and providing uh, and sharing resources, ideas for growth and everything else. And that we can literally if, if, if a kid needs to relocate for better opportunity, we want to be able to do it. You know, we want to have a for people with certain credentials to reach out to you or can just anybody like what are you any, particularly looking anybody, for? All you got to do is love your people and be willing okay. to put in the energy and effort. If it's a part that needs you credential to get something done, I'll make sure that happens. But right now, we just need people who care. Okay, That's where it starts at. You don't need credentials to care. And, and, okay. and, and, and that's what we need. People who want to put in the work who want to get behind it. And for like I said, for those of you who don't want to put in the work or that's not your cup of tea, we need you to get behind us financially. That's work to be done and everybody has a place. Okay. Okay. Well, I, well, I thank you so much. I know that we went over time, that's, but thank you so much for joining me. Um, and I need you to email me over the, all that contact information. I'm going to tag it to this video. So you all, please hit up Dr. Rick Wallace. Watch his channel. He is amazing. He has solutions he's not on that uh bashing and bandering and pointing fingers it's really solution based on how we could better come together because right now we are at war with each other and it's really just for entertainment purposes um right from what i see so right. thank you mr wallace thanks bye. have a good day bye. bye i'm asking now as we push a fundraiser that you support what the odyssey project is doing in the inner cities uh especially with programs like Black Men Lead, which is a rite of passage uh, initiative, and Restoring Ghetto for, Ghetto's Forgotten Daughters, which is a program focused on helping young girls, but boys as well, suffering from childhood sexual abuse, uh, rape, molestation, domestic abuse, uh, absentee fatherhood, and so many other things. Uh, the information will be in the box. Thank you.